It's been three years since Lorena McKennett has set off on a major tour. Time, which she has spent focused on her family and her community. As she prepares to get back into another round of touring, Lorena invited Craig Thompson out to the farm to catch up and find out more about the touring plans in the works. Lorena, it's great to have this opportunity to sit here in your peaceful retreat on your veranda uh, on the farm. Uh, thanks for inviting us out. Well, it's my pleasure. Great to have you here. <laughs> We've gone through a very difficult couple of years, uh, generally, as a population, but with the pandemic uh, greatly affecting the performing arts industry. And uh, even now, as the musical touring industry is getting back into, into swing, um, we see that we're not done with COVID yet. It's still having mm -hmm. uh, an impact. Tell us how you managed during the last two years of COVID and what strategies have you developed to keep your business going? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think it, it'd be important to set out that I'm probably luckier than a, and fortunate than a lot of artists, particularly those who are starting out. Uh, I would consider myself a, a legacy artist <laughs> of sorts and that my career got established by, let's say, you know, 1998 or 2000 at a height that uh, I could sustain certain, you know, gaps in performing or gaps in producing music and so on. In fact, in the fall of 2019, I had actually planned for a hiatus. I didn't know how long it would be. I thought it could be anything from the end of my career to just a, a few years. Uh, so I was actually already setting myself up for a pause. So little did I know that a few months later, this pandemic would come through. Uh, I, I primarily wanted to pause to get on top of some uh, personal things, to reevaluate where we were in the music industry and where the music industry is at and going, and how we might uh, engage in it in a in a successful and meaningful way. So um, we, you know, my time during the during COVID was spent very much on family matters. I wanted to try to do things focused on the environment, uh, civic matters, and indeed uh, went on to participate in a fairly uh, significant way in, uh, in, in, a, in a civic battle here in the Stratford area uh, concerning a, a float glass plant. Um, I didn't do much writing. <laughs> Many artists would take that time for writing. Um, but we were just keeping a keen eye on, you know, would I tour again and what the circumstances would be. So now we're uh, in 2022, 20, right. <laughs> September of 2022, yeah. um, that we've been keeping an eye on how things have do, evolved to see whether it would be possible or appropriate to tour again. So you've got a modest tour of Canada coming up soon, I understand. It's actually a very small tour uh, of parts of Ontario and parts of Quebec, uh, very similar to the one we finished off with in 2019. Not because we don't want to go across Canada, we're dying to get to other parts of Canada. Um, but it's, it's trickier than, uh, especially when you get into lots of infrastructure of buses and trucks and the expense that comes with that. Um, and the exposure one has from a financial standpoint. So we thought, well, why don't we just, what would be tiptoeing back into touring? Where would that be? And what would that look like from an infrastructure standpoint? So we decided we'd just do this uh, relatively local tour in, in Ontario and Quebec. Now, many of your fans are international beyond Ontario, Quebec, Canada and they're eager to see you back on tour and uh, you've been all over the world in the past. Are mm -hmm. you are you stepping your, dipping your toe into those <laughs> waters in some way or thinking about well, it? Well, we're, we're beyond thinking about it. We have actually uh, gone so far as to model uh, a, a tour internationally that's been sitting waiting to go on sale for about three months. But the tricky thing is, is that um, y y artists are not able to acquire COVID insurance. So if you acquire COVID, uh, you're, you, you're, you're completely out of luck in terms of getting any kind of insurance coverage. So for example, you know, when we'd be touring in Europe and be touring in two or three buses and maybe one or two trucks um, and some sound equipment, that could enter into the neighborhood of 300 to 
half a million dollars uh, that you pay up front. So if I contracted COVID uh, for five days or seven days, I mean, that would be extremely uh, damaging to the viability of the tour. And it's not so easy to go back and pick up dates because you really have to put together a whole other tour again. Um, and that's, there's lots of problems and complications of picking up and building a five-day tour, a six-day tour. So that's why uh, we've been moving very cautiously. We're waiting to see at this time if we can get some COVID insurance. Uh, but if not, that has very serious repercussions for us until the COVID has simmered down to the extent that one can see it as a something they can get coverage for or manage on tour. And it's not just performers of, of your scale. We're even seeing some stadium performers having to cancel. And yes. The, it, it's not just uh, uh, your uh, halls or your level of touring. No, I mean, you get the stadium tours uh, that are have had to cancel over the past year, but they're working in a different business model. And when you get up to those, you, you're looking at a scale of revenue that, that can actually survive and absorb the losses of, of a week or so of people on the road. And probably are very, very long tours that might go over, you know, um, many months or a year. So they would amortize and build in that cost into the Things. That's unfortunately that's not my situation. We've seen a lot of industries suffer from labor market challenges because mm -hmm, during COVID, mm -hmm. people have reevaluated their lives and said, "Oh, I don't want to do this anymore." Restaurants are having that problem. What particular problems does that pose to the music touring industry? Well, in the array of challenges of touring in the time of COVID right now, uh, getting crew is another one. Um, you know, a lot of people, as in other industries, and uh, have have discovered different things at ho while they've been at home, and they might have rearranged the priorities and felt like uh, that touring is really a young person's game with no family and and so on. But once you start having a family, it's 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 much trickier to be on the road. So if you are, then you need to be paid pretty well for the lifestyle that you live. So, uh, so, it, so now what we're seeing are our shortage of crew um, in the industry uh, in many positions. Um, and as I mentioned, you've got the, the, uh, the COVID, we're seeing significant increase of costs. Um, you know, when, if we were to tour in Europe again, as we are looking at for next year, you've got fuel costs that are, are, are huge and, and all the other things, uh, accommodation. So we're trying to keep the ticket prices uh, manageable. I always like to protect a lower tier so that people don't have to have, a, you know, a lot of money to come and see uh, us. But it's, uh, it's a juggling, it's a juggling match. For sure. Are you able to describe the tour in any way? Have you got anything that you can share about where you'd like to go and what kind of venues? Well, I mean, where I'd like to go is, uh, oh my goodness, so places we've been and all places we haven't been <laughs> all over the world, you know. I mean, we, we were touring in Australia in 95 and we've been in places in South America, of course, and throughout Europe, we've divided Europe into two, we usually divide it into two parts. We'll do Northern Europe inside venues in the spring, like March, and then we'll look to doing outside venues in Europe in the summertime. They're often uh, festivals, but we've performed at some pretty spectacular heritage uh, places uh, like the uh, Acropolis in, in Athens and the Greek amphitheater and Taramina in Sicily and, and places in Turkey and Lebanon. So those are all places I'd love to go back to. And of course, you know, Canada, it's, it's really, this has really been on my mind being Canadian and we had toured a lot more in Canada years ago. But we've learned we, we need to kind of divide it into, we do parts of Canada and the United States in one tour. And um, uh, rather than across Canada tour, it actually m makes more sense for us to tackle it that way. But uh, Tell me how important touring is. The business model has changed so much mm -hmm. over the last 30 years. Touring is almost an essential way now of reaching your fans, so it must be very challenging not being able to do that because that's your marketing engine for everything else. Yes, right? yes. 
I mean, certainly since the digital age, you know, uh, when the business model that was associated with analog, where you had a real vast ecosystem of radio and retailers and press and reviews, and and and, and the, when one gets the commodification of the music, um, you know, we're now paid, uh, let's say, ten cents per thousand plays on Spotify. I mean, I know that it w that's what it was not too long ago, or point zero 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 one three cents on YouTube, and that is a vast difference than, let's say, twenty five cents uh, on, a on a album record, or a yeah. CD. So that part of the business has has changed considerably, and we've not been able to <coughs> rely upon it as a as major revenue f uh, source as we used to. So it's really caused us to depend uh, upon touring to to be continue out there from a business standpoint. As I say, I mean I I've been lucky enough to build my career up where uh, I can. I've developed a mailing list and where we can reach people directly um, so we can endure and survive this to a, to a certain degree, but it can't, you know, it can also can't go on forever. Um, so you back to this tour, for example, we felt it necessary to um, uh, engage with our, f our customer. <laughs> hate calling people fans. <laughs> Many of them would be friends if we lived in the same <laughs> community, I'm sure. But we Well, I feel like you're their friend, so it's, uh, <laughs> there is that relationship. Well, uh, this will be one of the sadnesses of this upcoming touring cycle, of course, because I won't be able to meet people after the sh after the performance as I normally do. I've enjoyed that as much as anything. And I will stay, you know, an hour or two after the concert just meeting people, getting to know how they connected with my music and what it means to them. But we're also taking other measures. We've asked the venues to send out a message to the ticket holders to encourage them to come as vaccinated as possible. Um, to wear masks. We're really going to ask people to try to wear masks during the performance. Um, for ourselves, we'll be confining ourselves. We won't be going out in public so much. We'll be having HEPA filters in our dressing rooms. Um, we'll be traveling in a very careful way. Um, and that's about all we can do. But, you know, when one thinks about standing, you know, how careful we've been <laughs> for so yeah. many months, and then standing on a stage in front of 2,500 or 3,000 people, uh, unprotected for a couple of hours or so, it, it just doesn't feel quite uh, comfortable yet. And, I mean, I, I've had COVID. I had COVID. The first phase of it went by fairly quickly, about five or six days, but there was this lingering phase that involved a cough. And I know that that would have been very, very tricky. So, And who knows where COVID's going in the next uh, yes, yes, uh, yes, few months. Yes. Uh, it's better and to be safe than sorry, I guess. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, you know, this is, we're having to do it for, we're trying to encourage these measures for everyone's benefit, including our, uh, ourselves, so we can perform for people each night and and people can know that they're helping protect us to be able to go to the next venue to perform for somebody else. Um, it, it's interesting, you know, <coughs> to, to think about this time. My, my mother was a public health nurse, and I grew up with all of that comes with my mother being a public health nurse. She used to go into the schools and be give... Be careful, wash your hands, <laughs> do all the... Personal hygiene. Oh stuff, yes, yeah. oh yes, and don't wash your hands in the sink. But I remember seeing her in the schools because she was part of that era where uh, health nurses were in the schools vaccinating children, and and she was also a, of an era of polio, and a few of her nursing uh, uh, friends had contracted polio, and I had seen them in uh, like an iron lung as a child, which was really quite a startling because it's this long metal tubular thing and it seems so oppressive as an instrument of, 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 of dealing with this illness. So, and my high school history teacher had polio and sadly he succumbed, you know, at, to, at a young, young age. Um, so having grown up with that and, and feeling like no would have, nobody would have thought about getting a shot as a, as a, as an, 
or not getting a shot as an exercise of protecting your freedoms. Everyone was really clamoring to get protected for themselves and their family and their community. So uh, I've, uh, I approach this situation with that kind of mindset and I'm hoping that my, my friends will, will come to the concert in that spirit as well. Let's talk about your landmark album, The Visit, which recently celebrated <laughs> a very important milestone. Mm -hmm. uh, will your friends, your fans, <laughs> uh, can they expect a celebration of that in terms of a, a theme for the tour? How will you be reflecting it? Because that was last year was the anniversary, Yes, right? yes, yes. You released a special edition. Yes, we, we released a, a definitive edition, as it were. <laughs> All these like a remastered? <laughs> Free. Well, it had been remastered, but there was other there's other material in this definitive edition. So bonus material. Uh, bonus okay, material. Yeah. So, um, for example, there's an interview with myself and other people who were involved in my career at the time. My publicist, somebody from Warner Music Canada, uh, the engineer Jeff Wolpert, uh, my longtime colleague Brian Hughes is beamed in from Los Angeles to be part of this. So there's there's that that part that content. Uh, there are concerts of the time when we were performing and radio performances on NPR, I think. Um, we, we mixed it in Atmos, uh, so this high fidelity kind of surround sound kind of experience. And that's, uh, that's also available on Blu-ray. Um, so will that be material? Are you going to celebrate the visit on the tour? What kind of yes, material yes. will fans have to expect? On well, on the tour we'll be doing, we'll perform the whole uh, recording and in order. And it, I think we're going to be doing that in the second set. Um, so we'll just kind of launch ourselves through the whole recording. That's great. And um, we will be, I'll be touring with Brian Hughes, who plays guitar, and Bazuki and Mandola, and electric guitars, Caroline Laval on cello, of course, and Hugh Marsh on violin, Dudley Phillips on bass, and it'll be the five of us. Like a reunion. A bit of a, re oh yes, very much. I mean, the musicians are like family yeah. and, and the crew are as well. We're, yeah. we're lucky to go out and go with our crew. Now you've spoken a lot in the past about how important traveling is for you and going to these uh, unique and interesting places for your own creativity. Mm -hmm. um, is that part of your plan to get out there? Do you, you get any inspiration when you're on tour for new material or do you have to go on your I, own retreats? I go on a separate journey for those. those uh, they're kind of like research uh, trips and I send myself off and in some interesting places. <laughs> I remember taking the, the train across um, Siberia from Vladivostok to Moscow in 95. Uh, I went to Rajasthan, and that's the project that I have yet to bring into a recording. I mean, it's really rich uh, for inspiration, that, that trip. Um, I traveled throughout Morocco. Um, yeah, th those, those are very... But I, I, I find that um, I have to book time off for myself to go and do those. And these years where I've got other personal and professional responsibilities, it's tricky to get those. You must have a lot of stories that you still want to tell through music. There, there are. I mean, I think as when as the years go by, there are different themes that become important to you or more important. Um, also, studying the history of the Celts, I've been fascinated by by where that journey has taken me all over Europe and into Asia Minor. And um, but I'm also interested in how that history connects to the present. Um, let's say even pieces like Bonnie Portmore, which talks about the decimation of a of a tree in in this uh, part of Ireland, that and the history of of, of the the uh, lumber, the timber industry there to, to build ships and so on. <clears throat> so there are 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 there have been stories in the past, and uh, there are stories to tell. Certainly, the one trip from Rajasthan is is. Uh, is a, a trip that yet has yet to see its appearance creatively. <laughs> yeah. And history has a tendency to repeat itself. So I imagine a lot of the themes, I mean, we're looking at a lot of climate change uh, challenges we have right now, environmental, we've got all sorts of issues with peace and conflict and the, the world is in, in a little bit of turmoil. So if we look through your music to the past, there might be some lessons learned. Yes, I mean, not. Uh, I think there are lots of lessons in the past and in the present. I think uh, 
for me personally, I feel one of the biggest lessons to be learned is a sense of humility as a species. And I think there's a lot to be learned through or through indigenous cultures, which are like the early Celts, were very, very close to nature. Um, I think this is one of the biggest challenges of our time that has now manifested itself in climate change. And there's a piece in the visit called The Courtyard Lullaby, and in the last verse, uh, you know, I, I, I speak to what I felt I was learning about the importance to of listening to the land and listening to the, the nature and and really understanding it. You can't you can't protect it if you don't love it and if you don't understand it. So that that theme of nature and the environment continues to <clears throat> man it's manifest itself through my music and what I'm shining light on. Well, I know you've been itching to get back out on on tour again, but I'm sure your your community of fans, your your friends as you call <laughs> them, have also been very very patient and are eagerly awaiting your next road trip anything well, to say to them about well what I, I mean we we certainly are i would say one of the biggest joys of touring is again meeting people and having that interaction i mean you know from the stage you get this feeling uh and of course if you're able to meet folks afterward uh i mean for the, all those folks that are able to come to our concerts we're really looking forward to to making that connection again and and for the folks who we haven't been able to make it out to them yet, we haven't given up hope. <laughs> we'll keep trying, wherever that is. And we're very, very grateful for, for people's support. And people can stay up to date by being on the mailing list and checking for updates on your website. Yes, yes, uh, thank you. <laughs> Most, most certainly, uh, I think probably w the most important thing that we have to communicate with people is our mailing list. So we love to have that connection and so people can predictably and reliably know what we're up to and we can keep in touch. Well, that's great, Lorena. Thanks very much and best of luck with the tour. Yeah, thank you so much, Craig. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today.